It's a great day to study God's Word. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and in just a minute, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, will begin our study in Psalm 120. But first, he recorded a few introductory thoughts for today's message, so let's listen to those now. We welcome you aboard the Bible Bus today, friends, and we are going up to Jerusalem today. We are going up with about the next 15 Psalms. It's what the children of Israel sang when they went up to Jerusalem to the feast. And so the Bible bus is going to take that trip, and these are the songs that were sung. The road was rocky, but the music was not. It was these psalms, and they're marvelous, wonderful psalms. We're coming today to Psalm 120, and we trust you have your Bible and notes as you get on the bus And if you do not have the notes, all you have to do is write in and ask for them. Yes, we do still have a bit to go in our study of Psalms. So if you haven't yet gotten your copy of Dr. McGee's free notes and outlines, they're available in a couple of different formats. First, you can download them by individual book at ttb.org forward slash notes, or we have a resource that allows you to get the notes and outlines for all 66 books in one ebook. It's called Briefing the Bible. To get your copy, just download it at ttb.org forward slash briefing the Bible. Now, you can also order an abridged paperback copy there online or when you call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now, we've got just enough time to share a couple letters from our fellow passengers on the Bible bus. First, we've got a Facebook post. This is from a listener named Mark. God's providence is amazing. The book of Esther was where I first began listening to Dr. McGee over 25 years ago. Through God's providence, I was saved by His wonderful grace by faith alone in my risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, amen indeed, Mark. Thanks for faithfully joining us in God's Word for these last 25 years. And then here's a letter. This is from Sherry in Springfield, Missouri. Just a quick note about how, through the Bible, Dr. McGee and all of you have played an important part in our journey. I was diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer in February of this year. There were several weeks when we were uncertain of the diagnosis, and I was terrified. While we had been occasional listeners, my husband Chris suggested that we listen to Dr. McGee at night in bed during those weeks of uncertainty. His voice of comfort and reassurance filled the quiet and darkness in a significant way. This helped us remain certain of God's love for us, His grace and His mercy. Since receiving my diagnosis, one with a 90% plus rate of survival, we have continued to listen every night before bed. Thank you for being our light in the middle of the wilderness. Well, thank you, Sherry, for writing to us and sharing your story. And our prayer is that God would continue to bring you and Chris comfort as you study his word together. What's your story? How's God using his word in your life? You know we'd love to hear about it, so why don't you email us at BibleBus at ttb.org, or if you want to write a letter, write to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these songs that have been handed down from generation to generation. Bring us into your presence as we study them today. Grow our faith as a result of it. And let your glory and goodness be evident in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we've come at Psalm 120 to a package that It's 15 psalms, beginning with Psalm 120 and going through Psalm 134. They're called the Song of Degrees. That's the way I'm sure it is in your Bible. Actually, what we have here is, as Martin Luther translated it, the gradual psalms 
are a song of the higher choir. And an outstanding Hebrew scholar has translated it, the songs of the pilgrim caravans are on the homeward marches. Now, these 15 psalms were traveling songs, and they were used, I think, in two different ways. When the captives returned from Babylon, they used these psalms. They sang them on the way. And this same word here of going up, you find it back in Ezra, the seventh chapter, verse 9. It says, For upon the first day of the first month began he, that is Ezra, to go up from Babylon. And that's the word, to go up. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. Now, the most common use of these psalms was like this, that three times a year God required and commanded all the males to go up to Jerusalem to worship. And when they went up to Jerusalem, they took their families along. And as they ascended to Jerusalem from every direction, from Jerusalem, actually out to all parts of the world of that day where they were scattered, why, they would sing these psalms on the way to Jerusalem. One day it would be one of the psalms. The next day they came closer and higher. And as they approached Jerusalem, why, they would continue to sing the psalms until they came to the last one, the 134th, And you find them standing in the sanctuary of the Lord, singing praises to God. Now, these are songs of ascents. They'd sing them along the route. And the families, of course, would join the men, and they went up then by families. And they're called, therefore, the song of the pilgrim caravans. Now, you'll recall that we have one incident in the life of the Lord Jesus from the time of his virgin birth to the time he began his ministry when he was 30 years of age. Dr. Luke gives us that when they went up to Jerusalem. You will recall, when he was 12 years of age, they were returning, and they'd gone up for one of the feasts. And these three feasts, probably I should label them, they would be Passover, and they would be Pentecost, and tabernacles. Now, at one of those feasts, why, they went up. And on the way back, they were out a day's journey. And that place is pretty well known today. That's where all the caravans, when they went to Jerusalem, they'd meet there, go up together. It was a time of fellowship, renewing acquaintanceship, talking over old times, telling about how things were getting along. And then they'd all go up together singing these psalms. You remember the Lord Jesus, they missed him one day out when he was 12, and they had to return back to Jerusalem. Now, these psalms have another very wonderful meaning. And by the way, someone may say, are you sure that this is the way it was done? We have a very interesting statement made in Psalm 122, and it says in verse 3, Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. Yes, they went up three times a year at these great feast days to return thanks to God, to worship Him and to offer sacrifices there. Now, we find a very wonderful spiritual meaning. I didn't want to say that word, and yet there is a great spiritual meaning here. And the very interesting thing that many of the writers of the Talmud pointed it out. And the thing they pointed out was this, that their life is like this. We come to God as a sinner. We're away from him, separated from him, alienated from him. And then we come to him, and 
as we come to him in salvation, we come to him in our sanctification, that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of him. And so it's a constant going up, and we're climbing a spiritual way. And friends, you and I ought to be farther along today than we were last year, and we ought to recognize that. Now we begin this journey with Psalm 120. Now, the pilgrim that we are looking at here and his family, we are going to find out where he lives. So let me read Psalm 120. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Now, this is one of the most marvelous psalms that we've seen, and it's relevant to the present hour, and especially for the nation Israel. Now, will you note this, because this is very important to see. Now, this pilgrim lived, he says, in Meshach in Kedar. Now, who is Meshach? Meshach was one of the sons of Japheth. You find that back in Genesis 10, verse 2. And from Japheth came the Gentile nation. And friends, that's where Israel is today, scattered among the Gentiles throughout the world. They dwell in Meshach. And Kedar, he was a son of Ishmael. Does that tell you anything? He was living among the Arabs. That's rather up to date, is it not? That's where he lived. And it actually was not a very good neighborhood. He really lived in a ghetto because there were a bunch of gossips around there, had mean tongues. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. Not a very good neighborhood. He'd been maligned, lied about. And I do believe that no people have been probably lied about and maligned and persecuted as the Jew has. Now, we are hearing a great deal today about minority groups. Now, the very interesting thing is the Jew's been able to make his way among all nations, among all people. But he's been criticized. Anti-Semitism is something that is quite real. But he's been able to survive all of it. And he's a minority group among the Gentiles and among the peoples of the world today. So he's lived in the place of gossip and of quarrels and of tensions and problems and burdens. And I'm not sure, but what that is a picture of you and me. And now the time has come to go to Jerusalem. And it's a time when you pack up your troubles and your old kit bag and you start toward Jerusalem. He left his burdens at home. And so he left his Meshach, and he left his Kedar, and he now goes to Jerusalem. And he lived in a world of war. He says, My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace. But when I speak, they're for war. That's rather up to date, isn't it? It's a wonder the high critic today who likes to move everything in the Bible up to date, that is, give it a late dating. It's too bad that he didn't have someone over there today write this, because it's very much up to date, by the way. Now he's going up to Jerusalem to worship. And Jerusalem is a city of peace. Sure isn't today. It's a rather dangerous place to be, by the way. But it was different then, and it's going to be different in the future. Now he's on the way up. We come to Psalm 121. Now he's come from some direction, northeast, south, and west, every direction. 
Now I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. And I think that it would be well to change that here, and I can't quite understand why some of the translations that have attempted to make changes haven't made one at this particular point here, because it should be. It's a question. This man's not looking to the hills. He's looking to God. He makes it very clear. Shall I lift my eyes up to the hills? From whence cometh my help? Then he answers it. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now you see the pilgrim is drawing nigh to Jerusalem. And any direction you come to Jerusalem, friends, you're going to come through the hills. First time I came to Jerusalem, I came from the east, across the Jordan River. And you come up some pretty rugged country. The second time I came from Tel Aviv and drove up by bus that time. It was a car before, and the hills were hillier. And I've come from the south, and I've come from the north. And friends, any direction you approach Jerusalem, you're in the hills. And so this man now has come inside of the hills of Judea. And as he comes inside of the hills of Judea, there are places where heathen worshiped on top of the hills. That's where they put their altars. He says, shall I lift up mine eyes to the hills? From whence cometh my help? Doesn't come in that direction at all. And that I think it's something very important to note. I'd like to read in this connection Jeremiah 3.23. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. And that's what this pilgrim now is. He draws near to Jerusalem. And then he goes on to say, He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. And that word really, he won't suffer you to totter. You know, those of us that are senior citizens today, we begin to totter just a little. I notice I'm not as sure-footed as I once was. He's going to hold you up, by the way. He who keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he who keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. And I'd like to give a little different translation of this, if you don't mind, because... I think it brings out something quite wonderful here. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Thy keeper will not slumber. Behold, neither slumbereth nor sleepeth the keeper of Israel. Jehovah is thy keeper. Jehovah is thy shade upon the right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall keep thee from all evil. He shall keep thy soul. Jehovah shall keep thy going out and thy coming in from henceforth and forever. Now, this is quite a wonderful section you can see here. And now he's not looking to the hills for strength. He's looking to the Lord. He's looking to Jehovah. And Jehovah's his keeper. And you notice the word that we have, verses 7 and 8, is the Lord shall preserve thee. That has to do with thee wonderful keeping power of God. He preserveth you. And you remember Peter put it like this? Kept by the power of God. Now, there are two ways of preserving anything. You can preserve anything like fruits or vegetables. You can preserve them in sugar or in vinegar. Those are the two ways. And there are a lot of Christians that are preserved both ways, by the way. There are some Christians preserved in sugar. They're nice, sweet folk. And the others that have been preserved in vinegar, and they're not quite so, you know, wonderful. The pilgrim now is moving toward Jerusalem along the route. And there are the hills. The Mount of Olives is there, you see. Mount Zion now. And he's camped along the route. Because you see, Howard Johnson and the Holiday Inn and Ramada Inns just hadn't got there to put up motels. And so they just camped along the way. And they're looking to Jehovah to keep them. And as they move on, why, he's going to come now in sight of Jerusalem. This is quite wonderful as we move along here. And there's something else I think that we should notice. He says, 
My help now cometh from Jehovah. Oh, what a glorious assurance that is. And he's not going to let me totter and fall. And there's a great deal in Scripture about that. Proverbs 3.26 says, For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot being taken. Won't let you fall. And in Psalm 37, we've already seen that. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And then again he says, He keepeth the feet of his saints. Wonderful. And you noticed he washed feet also. And now we are told in, the, I suppose, the last benediction you have in the Bible, it's in the little epistle of Jude, now unto him that is able to keep you from not falling, stumbling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. He's able to keep us. He's the keeper of Israel, and he's the keeper of his own today. You notice he keeps but day and night. He doesn't slumber or sleep. And the sun or the moon won't hurt you. That is, they came up at certain seasons, and that sun over there is hot, and he'd keep them in the heat. But what about the moon by night? Somebody says, now you don't believe that kind of thing, do you? Well, I don't know. You know, the word for the moon is luna. Can you think of a word that comes from that? Yeah, you're right. It's the word lunatic. It drives a lot of people crazy. Somebody says the moon doesn't affect us, does it? Well, it affects the tide. And I don't know. I can remember when I was young, and I used to take a girl out on a date. And I want to tell you, friends, it sure made it quite unusual to get in the moonlight. The moon has an effect on us, and he can keep you. He can keep you whether it's the sunshine or the moonlight. Say, this is a very wonderful psalm. Now we're moving on, and we come to Psalm 123, and he's coming to Jerusalem now. And this psalm has been called the Eye of Hope. Will you notice it? Under thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou who dwellest in the heavens. Now he's making it very clear that God is not in a box in Jerusalem, and that the critic has been wrong when he has said that Israel thought God dwelt in a little temple in Jerusalem. He makes it abundantly clear here that he didn't believe that. He says, "...under thee lift up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens." And he's the Creator. And he says, "...behold, as the eyes of servants look under the hand of their masters, the eyes of a maiden under the hand of a mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God." until he has mercy upon us. I wonder if we look to God like that. You know when you're working for somebody, you watch the clock and you watch the boss, you're very sure you're working when he's watching you. May I say to you, how many of us live as if God is looking at us all the time? Well, he is. Verse 3, "...have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt." They have been despised in the world. They're coming to Jerusalem. They're asking for mercy, and they know that they are sinners and that they need mercy from God. They haven't come to Jerusalem to pat themselves on the back. And he says, Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scoffing of those who are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. And they now have come to Jerusalem, the eye of hope. They're looking to the one that dwelleth in the heavens, I wonder if we're looking that direction today. Now, when we come to Psalm 124, it's a historical psalm. It's the eye of the past. The Psalm 123 is the eye of the future, hope. And this one is the eye of the past. It's that of faith, you see. But we're going to have to wait till next time to continue this march. And after all, I think we ought to camp for the night. I have to leave off there today, so until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, as we camp for the night, actually for the weekend, 
Let's take some time and read Psalms 122 to 143 to prepare our hearts for next week's lessons. To download the entire reading schedule for our journey through Psalms, visit ttb.org forward slash bookmark or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE and we'll put one in the mail to you along with our monthly newsletter. Now, I hope that you'll join me for this week's Sunday sermon. It's titled, Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land. If you want to listen online or by app or see if your local station carries the Sunday sermon, then you need to visit our website, ttb.org. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you right back here on Monday as we continue our wonderful journey through the Bible. Jesus made it all, to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.